make this horribly uncomfortable and uptight. We can be more relaxed and all learn together, which I prefer to do because I don't like the uptight. That's why we don't ever wear white coats in our clinic. There's no uh, standing up above our patients always, and that's another key cool thing to do. Always sit at the same level as your patients. Try to. Try to I usually sit on the bed with them, or we have like those little rolling stools that we type on our computers with. And so I'm usually at the same level of them or below them, because if not, you kind of come off like, you know, talking down to them. So just when you get out and practicing, the better you make friends with your patients and let them trust you, the better off things are. So once again, with my fancy stick and my clicker here, we will advance through this. Um, anybody have any questions so far? All right, so orthopedic basic treatment. So a lot of this stuff, especially if you've, I'm your third one today, you've heard of NSAIDs before, you know, ibuprofen, Motrin, Aleve, Advil, things like that. A lot of this is kind of common sense. I mean, you guys are in PA school, and I'm assuming most of you have been hurt or at least sprained your ankle one time in your life. So then you know what the rice formula is, right? The rest, ice, compression, elevation. Uh, activity restriction, rest, and mobilization specifics for each injury. That's kind of the harder part of orthopedics, if you ask me, especially right now, because we're getting into two a day season. We're getting into the starting of school. People are starting to get hurt, so people want to get really specific because, you know, everybody's little boy is the next Nolan Ryan or the next Brett Favre. And, you know, they've got to be on the field. You don't understand. He's six years old, but he's got a college scholarship riding on a few week football. Uh, so, it, you know, you got to kind of take that with a grain of salt, but yes, yeah, so, it, so, and the one thing I try to tell our patients is the average, tell them the averages of things. The average ankle sprain takes six to eight weeks to get better. Could your little son, who's the next Brett Favre, get quicker than that? Sure you can, but I don't know if he will or not, so we kind of have to tell coaches that. Coaches, quick tip on coaches too, when coaches start getting real pushy with it, what I always ask the parents to do is just have the coach give me a blank check, and if all this goes wrong and your little boy has to have surgery, I'll let him pay for it. It's amazing how them kind of back off whenever they do that. Okay, so next, physical therapy, occupational therapy, highly underutilized for minor injuries. You would not believe how many people I have to beg to put ice on their ankle. You would not believe how many people I have to beg to go to physical therapy. Any of you who've ever had physical therapy, it's actually pretty good stuff. Uh, and it doesn't have to be minor injuries, too. I mean, we use physical therapy after our total knees, total shoulders, total hips, total toes. You didn't know there was a total toe, did you? You can actually replace your big toe now. Um, no, it's not a joke. We really can't replace your big toe. Like your first CMC joint, or MTP joint, excuse me. Uh, more effective in pain control in the long run. The problem with what that means is whenever you have narcotics. We only give our patients narcotics for the first three months after surgery. If they need them after that, they go to pain management. So that's why we like to do stuff like this because if we can get them in physical therapy and occupational therapy and get them in a good relationship with them, this goes a lot better and sometimes it will even last longer than taking narcotics does. Also, get good friends with the physical therapist. It is a team thing. Once again, it is not a dictatorship because I've had so many times a physical therapist that will call me because, you know, the problem is an orthopedics PA is we get about a 15-minute snapshot of what's going on in their lives. This is what they look like today. I really don't get to see them walk that much. I really don't get to see how their shoulder's working. So the physical therapist, I always, the first time I meet any physical therapist, I give them my cell phone number. And I'll say, if you see anybody of mine who you think that there's something more going on than what the diagnosis we have on hand is, give me a call because I don't want to be barking up the wrong tree, so to speak. Does so that make sense, kind of? This is going to be long, but we have to do this all day. All right, so I know you guys have already had anatomy, so once again, fracture descriptions, excuse me. So, you know, we know the different parts of our bone, the epiphysis, the metaphysis, the diaphysis, and then it just goes reverse, metaphysis, diaphysis, epiphysis down here. Um, you know, a lot of times, and whenever we start talking about fractures, it's all about the fractured description. And I don't know if you guys are they're making you learn it or not, but hi. Um, they are, uh, you'll always hear what I call the dead guy names, the Collies, the Smiths, the Bartons, the, all these things that nobody knows who they are. The reason I don't like using those, and I learned this early on, in uh, my first job out of PA school was in Las Vegas working for a hand surgeon, and we would get calls from the emergency room doctors and they would say, hey, I've got this and that, and nine times out of ten, it wasn't even right. So I don't like names, I would rather you describe the fracture to me. Now, does everybody know how to describe? A fracture. Okay. Anybody? Which, which, what? As far as the terms, what piece do you describe? Do you describe the distal piece or the proximal piece? 
You're all looking at me glossy-eyed. Distal is away, proximal is towards, right? So let's say I had a distal radius fracture right here, right? So would you describe to me what the distal piece was doing or the proximal piece? The distal, right? So everybody knows in its, in its relationship to the proximal piece. So if you have a fracture that is bent back this way, that is a distal radius fracture with a dorsal angulation, right? Instead of calling it the dead guy name, I want to know what it looks like. Is it translated? Is it displaced? Is it this or that or the other? So some doctors want to use, like I said, Coley, Smith, Bartons, uh, things like that. To me, I would really just say, this is what it looks like to me, and then we go from there. Okay? Um, everybody's good on anatomy here, right? Okay. So, once again, the extent of it, is it complete or incomplete? Cracker, hairline, buckle, green stick, you guys know all this stuff. So basically, these are just the different types. You've got a normal bone, then you've got a transverse, go straight across. Oblique is kind of a diagonal. Spiral is if you took the, each end of the bone and literally twisted it. Comminute means it's all crunched up in the middle, and then segmental is more than one piece. And once again, if you can use those words instead of names, that helps out whoever you're talking to on the other end of the line, especially in the chance that you may be wrong about the name you're calling it. Not that PAs are ever wrong, I'm just saying it happens. Okay, once again, fracture description, relation of the fractured segments, displaced, non-displaced, angulated, translated, rotated, distracted, shortened, overriding, all of those things. And once again, relationship to the external environment. If you have a closed fracture, that is a lot less emergent than an open fracture because open fractures can get infected, osteomyelitis, things like that. So we'll put that in as well. So usually if you're describing it, you know, I've got a six-year-old, uh, skeletally immature male with a closed. Always make sure you include that because that kind of makes the, uh, the uh, sphincter factor kind of go down a little bit. Um, affects uh, management of fracture and care once again because if you call somebody, if you're working in Poto, Oklahoma, is anybody from Poto? All right, good. So Poto, Oklahoma, and there's nobody around, and you're calling the big city at 3 o'clock in the morning to get a hold of an orthopedist, you better make sure you're describing it accurately because there's no worse thing than kind of telling somebody the wrong thing. All right, so, okay, salt to hairs classifications, I'm sure you guys know all this already, but, you know, normal is just where it's like that, straight across. The S is not type 1, straight across. A, the fracture line goes out above, and remember that the articular surface always has to be pointed down for this. If you have the hand and the fingers up towards the sky, you have to switch it in your brain. Um, lower, below, type 4 is through or two all the way through, and then type 5 is, uh, it says erasure of the growth plates, but I call it ER because that means it's all crunched together and they probably need to go to the emergency room. What I always tell our patients is, because the hardest part for Salter Harris fractures, am I talking too loud, loud enough, too fast, everything's good, okay, um, is this. If I walked in here today and said, hey, my name's Travis, what's between my hands? You guys don't know. It could be an M&M or a paperclip or a penny or whatever, hopefully an M&M. But the thing about it is, is, is you don't know what's between my hands. So whenever you have a patient that's sent to you from the emergency room with a known injury, and all of a sudden they say, well, yeah, the doctor told me it was broken, you can't throw that guy under the bus, right? So you can't go, well, there's no fracture there. I don't see any fracture. So remember this and write this down. Tenderness to palpation over an or percussion, which means to tap on it, over an open growth plate is a fracture until proven otherwise. Because a lot of times you will come in and people will have a number one. And then you want to go, I don't see a fracture. There's no fracture there. What are you talking about? The guy who sent you here is full. You know, but it's not, because then you tap on it and you go, ooh, maybe they're right, maybe it is broken. So once again, tenderness to palpation over an open growth plate is a fracture until proven otherwise. Okay? So that's kind of how that goes. Um, also, there is a great book called Emergency, I think it's Emergency Radiology. I think you're the, actually the one that recommended it to me. And it goes through and it actually has all of the false negatives and positives. Like if, I don't know if you guys have ever seen a skeletally immature foot, but all of the growth plates are transverse across the whole foot except for your fifth metatarsal, and it goes up and down. So it doesn't look like the others, so whenever Billy falls off his skateboard and the side of his foot hurts, well that's a fracture because it looks different than all the other ones. But actually your growth plate on that particular metatarsal is completely different than the other ones. So that's another good thing to remember, and it's a great book to have. I'll bring it next week uh, whenever I lecture, and you guys can look at it, those of you who are wanting to go in the emergency room or into orthopedics. Any questions on Salter Harris? No? 
Okay, shoulder. Glenohumeral dislocation is 95% of all shoulder dislocations, anterior being the most, 5% of course being posterior. The axillary nerve is the most common injured whenever it dislocates. Everybody knows where your axillary nerve is on your shoulder, right? And that's going to be important here in a little bit. What happens if you bag your axillary nerve? What can you not feel? Right over here. Can't feel it. Okay? So deltoid uh, sensation. So if you are doing the close reduction or something like that on somebody, and they go, man, it's kind of funny. My shoulder feels better, but I can't feel my side of my shoulder. You may want to do something about that. Most commonly caused by a fall on an abducted, externally rotated shoulder. So what I want you to think about is think about the quarterback who is fixing to throw the ball and gets hit back <coughs> like this. Literally falling forward like Superman and coming back like that. Um, we actually had a lady who was, I think she was last week, and she was on a Stairmaster at the gym. And instead of hitting the down button, which makes it go slower, she hit the up button so both pedals dropped she still hung on and dislocated both of her shoulders. So it can happen any which way you want to, but that's how it kind of usually happens, is an externally rotated arm. Um, the only reason that would be, this is kind of a cool one I added in there, I think at least, three E's of posterior shoulder dislocation. So you know that 95% of shoulder dislocations are anterior, so why in the world would somebody have one that's posterior? Remember the three E's, alcohol, epilepsy, and electricity. When people have seizures, their shoulders come out the back for some reason more than they go out the front. When people are drunk and relaxed and they have a bad fall, they go out the back instead of the front sometimes. And then whenever you're electrocuted, obviously everything seizes up and it sometimes goes out the back and not the front. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, good. All right, shoulder glenohumeral dislocation. So examination. So if you look on this guy... So obviously there's a little bit of deformity here. This is the normal shoulder. This shoulder's sunken down. So you can actually see his acromion right there. You can see his, his humeral head around right there. And this is what I was telling you earlier about the axillary nerve. We'll come back to this. But it's slightly abducted, abducted excuse me, externally rotated, loss of the rounded appearance of the acromion. So whenever you look at somebody's shoulder with their deltoid in their shoulder in joint, it should look round whenever not. Like that, it kind of looks like you have a sock puppet and like that, and you can push in on it right there on their deltoid. Uh, they'll resist at any movement at all, because you'll say, okay, let me see your shoulders start moving it, and they will freak out however you try to move it. So just kind of let it hang there. Um, and the reason, I'm going to come back to this to show you something. So the dis uh, shoulder, once again, dislocation, radiology, the three views of the x-ray with an axillary view. An axillary view on somebody who has a dislocated is kind of tough. Now, you guys know the AP view. And you've probably seen the scapular Y that I'm going to show you here in a second. An axillary view is where you have them lay down on the table. And if you can imagine having a dislocated shoulder and then me try to hold your shoulder out with the film back here. And then you try to shoot up through their armpit. Because a lot of times whenever you see it, if you see an AP view, a lot of times it's not sunken down in front like it is. It's right there in the middle. And then when you take the axillary view and get it like this, now you see it's out. So it's all, it's all a relative thing. Some places will give you axillary views, but it really depends upon the patient. Are they going to lay down on a table and let you take their dislocated arm and go, now hang on, this isn't going to be that bad, and then yank it out there like that. Uh, once again, scapular wide, and I think we have an illustration of this. So this is obviously a glenohumeral anterior inferior. Remember, the most common is anterior. And same thing again. Okay, so here's your scapular Y. And if you see, there's your scapular Y. So there's the, the two branches, the Y and then down. Obviously, this is normally where it's supposed to be anterior and posterior, okay? Um, so we'll go through this, and I'm going to go back to that picture of that kid. So associated injuries are heel sacs deformity. So the way that I explain the heel sacs deformity to our patients is, is that if your shoulder is a ball and socket joint right now, that socket, everybody thinks it's this socket like this. It's actually not. It's more of a plate. It's a very sharp plate. And so when your shoulder dislocates, your body says, hey, I'm kind of uncomfortable with this, and I'd prefer my shoulder not be dislocated. So it tries to bring it back in. That's your body's mechanism of like this. Well, when it does, you take this soft bone, and you smack it on that plate so it makes a little ridge, kind of like if you dig your fingernail into a uh, styrofoam cup to like write your name on it. That's honest to God what it looks like. It just makes a little line right there. And sometimes, if it's their first time out, it will literally get caught on there. That's why that whole thing, has anybody in here, oh, you guys are probably too young to see Lethal Weapon, Bill Gibson, whenever he slams his shoulder on it when it's dislocated, no chance in hell he did it like that. He would break his shoulder. I'm just saying. It's cool for Hollywood, but you can't do it like that. 
uh, that I've ever seen. So once again, especially if they're a first-time dislocator. So if you ever have somebody that came into your office and said, man, I dislocated my shoulder and I put it back in on my own, it's not their first time. And I'll bet you money on it. Uh, so that's a heel sax deformity. So it's literally where you make a notch in the humeral head, the articular cartilage of the humeral head, with your glenoid, with that ring. Um, and then there's, of course, the labral tear. And everybody, and the way I describe that is our, our <coughs> glenoid is, once again, more like a flat plate. So if you put a little rubber bumper around it, and the way that I describe it to our patients, I'm a very bad analogy guy, but everybody leaves knowing what they're talking about. And I always tell people it's kind of like going bumper bowling with the kids. You put the bumpers in the side so the ball stays in the middle, right? Has anybody gone bumper bowling with kids? Uh, so it's like, it's like a circular bumper. That's what your labrum does. It keeps the ball in the middle. So obviously if your ball comes out, it would be very easy to imagine you taking a piece of that with it. That's called a labral tear. A bank heart lesion is when you have a labral tear that also pulls off a piece of the bone that goes with it. Does that make sense? So you tear off a piece of the glenoid. Uh, treatment, close reduction through manipulation of the humeral head. Remember to get the post-reduction x-rays because if you think it's in and they go, yeah, it feels comfortable, you have to prove that it was in before they leave your office or emergency room or whatnot. Put them in an immobilizer. If you only have a sling, a sling is good enough, but put them in a sling and then use a, we call them Texas Ace wraps, but they're six inch Ace wraps, but they're really, really thick. So put them in their sling in a, in a parallel to the ground position, kind of right across their heart, and then wrap them with that Ace wrap a bunch of times around because the sling, remember, controls up and down, but there's nothing that controls away from your body, and that's what the Ace wrap would be for. Um, and then operative with recurrent and chronic. Um, so that is that part of it. Okay, so this is, goes back to the reduction techniques. And these are one of those things that I don't recommend that you do unless you've seen it done before and then you kind of practice at it because believe me, it's not as fun as it sounds. Um, so the snowbird or the snow mask technique is probably our most common. Usually by the time people get up to us in the orthopedic uh, office, they've already been reduced nine times out of ten. But if they're not, or if once again you're out in the middle of nowhere, so what the snowbird or the snow mass is, is as you can see, this is your chromium and their humeral head and all that's down there. So what do you have a straight shot at right there if you were to give them an injection? Their joint, right? So what the snow mass <coughs> technique is, is you get 20 cc's of lidocaine, you go right in underneath the acromion, and that's why I was talking about the axillary nerve. The axillary nerve lifts three to five centimeters underneath the inferior portion of your acromion, right? So if I know that my axillary nerve is somewhere right there, there's an underneath, so you want to hug right underneath that acromion and go straight in, and you put 20 cc's of lidocaine in their joint. Well, what does that do? Well, the lidocaine deadens all the capsular nerves, right? So therefore, it's not as painful, but it also blows everything up. 20 cc's is a lot of fluid. So if you distract it, and then all you do, do you mind coming up here for me? <clears throat> the biggest thing that will keep a shoulder out is your deltoid. So if you have a big, strong bodybuilder in there, it's going to be an all-day event, right? So if you go ahead and see right here. So what we would do is, after once again finding the acromion and going right underneath it, just go straight in, flood the joint, let it sit there a little bit, kind of like if you're going to sew up somebody's finger, and then very carefully, no, you just relax your shoulders out. So just let it hang. <laughs> so what you would do is, you would just start distracting it. And what you're trying to do is fatigue that deltoid muscle. Because right now, remember, their brain is going, I don't like this. And so if you've ever seen any little kid, pro football player, whatever, what's the first thing they do when they hurt their shoulder? We all do this. No matter who you are, the first thing you want to do is get as close to your body as you can. That's because of your deltoid, which is a very big, very strong muscle on those folks. So what you're going to do is just keep pulling down and just keep distracting it, keep distracting it, until it just gets so tired it says, I give up. And guess what happens? It goes right back in. And there's no tears. There's not a lot of you know foot and armpit pulling them like you're water skiing. It's just that easy. It's not easy. I shouldn't have said that. It's not just that easy, but that is one of the easier ways to do it. Thank you very much. I appreciate you. So that's the snowbird or the snow mask or the snowbird technique. All right. So upright technique. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Whichever first, ma'am. No. Yes. Okay, sir. All right. Um, you, you just said that you were pulling down on the arm. You said distract because you're, what you're trying to do is the deltoid is fighting against you. The deltoid and their traps and everything is coming up like this, right? So what you're doing is you're literally trying to exhaust their deltoid so that it will stop pulling so hard. 
And as soon as that relaxes, it's the same thing for a hip if you've, if you've ever had to do that before. Um, but, and that can take several people to do sometimes. But as soon as, you, as, soon as that lets go, it all, and with this joint being distracted, remember you just put 20 cc's of fluid in there, it comes unperched off that and it just relaxes right back in. You don't have to physically like shove it back up or anything. Usually once they relax, you can, it's almost just like guiding it home a little bit. Ma'am? I have a question. You're just raising your hand. Yeah. You're raising your hand to show me he was raising his hand. <laughs> Look at that teamwork. <laughs> Altruism at its best. Uh, the Stimson technique is the probably the second most common one, and that is this one, or some people call it a bed sheet. It's the same thing. It's you're seriously trying to um, uh, exhaust uh, the deltoid. So what you do is you have one of your companions or fellow practitioners or whatever. If they're laying on the bed, you put a bed sheet around it like that. Usually that guy gets his foot on it like this, and then you get a hold of their wrist, and you sit there and pull until they get tired. Once again, then it'll go back in. The hard part is, unless they look like that first guy where you can physically just see it down and out, which if it's out, it's going to look like that, then I would still recommend the lidocaine because it doesn't hurt as bad, they're not as tense, and then they're going to have a better experience with it so far. Okay, so this is the Stimson technique. There's nothing wrong with this one. It just takes a heck of a lot longer. All right? And then some of those other ones, honestly, God, I don't know what they are, the upright technique and all that. Um, we use the Stimson and the Snowbird if we ever have to do it. Um, the hard part is sometimes, like um, our group, I was in charge of the UCO hockey team for seven seasons. And so the hard part is, is if a hockey player comes over to you and goes, hey, dude, my shoulder's out, what are you going to do about it? I can't go, well, hang on real fast, let me go get my bed sheet real fast and all that. So there's always going to be this urgency, right? Well, first of all, there's never an urgency because you also have to be very careful that it's not broken. Because what if they have a proximal humerus fracture and then they go, well, Travis put his foot in my armpit and was pulling on it. I mean, sometimes that doesn't work out well. So you need to make pretty for sure that that's not broken before you start yanking on it. That's why it's nice to not get in a hurry, get an x-ray, know what you're dealing with. Where is the fracture? Usually you can tell it'll be out the front because this is dropped down and they'll have a fullness in their armpit. They'll go, man, it feels like I got something in my armpit. It's their humeral head. Um, so once again, don't get in a rush to get it back in. If you're out on the sidelines or whatever, if you don't feel comfortable doing this, just do the same thing. Any of you who ever cover, if you do orthopedics, more than likely you're going to be covering some teams, whether it be football or hockey or anything. And even soccer nowadays isn't really that much of a non-contact sport. Always just get you a big sling and an ace wrap in there because all you have to do is just sling them up, immobilize them, which is completely appropriate, and get them off the field and to somebody if you don't feel like you can do it. Like we had, a, we had one of our hockey goalies that had dislocated his shoulder. I can't even tell you how many times. And his was so easy, he would come over, and all I would have to do is take his wrist and just bring him straight up, and his would fall back in every time. I, didn't, I, didn't, I could do it with one hand almost, because his came out multiple times, but he would never do anything about it. So you kind of got to know, you know, hey, is this your first time your shoulder's ever come out? Are you sure it's out? Does it feel like it's out to you? Because they'll know whether it's out or not. Okay? Any questions so far about anything? Shoulder dislocations, anything so far? You guys hanging with me? I know I'm your last one. We'll get through it. Okay? Um, all right. So, the chromioclavicular joint injury. Injury to the acromioclavicular joint involving the coracoacromial and the acromioclavicular ligaments. Type 1 through 6 sprain uh, typically occurs from a direct fall or fall or direct trauma to the acromion. We call this a knockdown injury. And usually it's whenever you have something knock the side that hits their acromion. So usually it's a hockey player going into the boards after being checked. It's a football player leaning in with their shoulder. Anything that you kind of hit like this, snowboarders get this all the time. Snowboarders break their wrist and they get AC separation. Skiers always tear up their knees and their back. So if you have a snowboarder who came in and goes, yeah, man, I was going down the mountain and I caught the front limp of my board and I kind of went in the snow like this, you can almost tell already it's going to be like that. And I'm sure through you guys' clinical phase, which you're not too yet, I don't guess, but you're going to start hearing things. And that's the other thing about orthopedics. A lot of times people just start telling a story and you're like, okay, you're, you've got a type 1 separation or whatever. You'll just get used to hearing it or they'll say, yeah, I, was, I had my foot planted and I went to twist like this, asked my mom a question and I felt the pop, okay, they've got a meniscal tear. You know what I mean? So you're going to start hearing these things and you'll get very, very good at it. Um, in, uh, once again, examination, so tenderness to palpation over the acromioclavicular joint. Uh, there's also something called a cross-body test or a crossover test, which is this one right here. So basically, you just have the patient 
And what will bother patients with acromioclavicular joint injuries is any kind of a hugging. So if they, I mean, I'm not saying to hug them, but you try to <laughs> mimic it. You can if you want. But you basically just take their shoulder and start coming over like this, and they will die right there. They'll go, no, 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 that hurts so bad right there. They also usually, whenever you get to the, we get to the empty can portion for the rotator cuff injuries, an empty can test is where you put their arm at a 45 degree angle out like this, and they push up and you push down with their thumb down. That will light up their AC joint, okay? This other thing, this AC shear test, while I'm on this thing, I can't imagine you having an AC separation and me going, okay, little Billy, I'm going to take my hands on the front and the back, and I'm going to squeeze the part that hurts on you really hard, and we're going to see if that bothers you. I have never used that. I honestly don't recommend using it, because remember, with an AC separation, when you get out of the shower the next time, just look, you see a little bump right there. If it's separated, that bump's going to be bigger. There's your diagnosis, right? So you don't have to squeeze on somebody to go, oh, I wonder if that bump's bigger or not. She's already checking hers. Look, didn't even wait for the shower. Good job. Um, so, once again, here's your different types. Types 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Now, anybody watch OU football or follow it? Remember when Sam Bradford got hurt at Texas and he had a type 3 separation? Remember all the media throwing a fit about it because should he have surgery, should he not? He's going to the NFL, stuff like that. So the rule of thumb usually is one, two, three, let it be, okay? Because a lot of times, well, one, you can't even see it. You can't even see it on the x-ray. They'll just come in and say, look, I got hit, and this bump up on my shoulder is really sore, but there's no radiological findings of any kind of an uh, injury. Grade two, and I wish I had a better picture of it, and I'll see if we can get one. But the way that you can grade a grade two off of an x-ray is the bottom, if this is my uh, chromium and this is my clavicle, the bottom of my clavicle will be 50% higher than my chromium. So you can actually just look at it. If it's 50% higher, that's a type 2. If it's 100% higher, it's a type 3. That's the best way to look at it. And I'll see if I have a picture on here. Oh, and of course those are blacked out. Let me see if we can go through here real fast. Can you, if you guys can blow this one up on your, on your computers, I mean, I don't think this little mouse will do it. But, but basically, the bottom surface of the acromion should be, I'm sorry, the clavicle should be equal with the bottom surface of the acromion. That's a type 1 with injury and with pain. A type 2 is when the bottom surface, once again, of the clavicle is 50% higher. So if you draw a line right down the underneath surface of the clavicle, it should hit the acromion right at the halfway mark. Type 3, it will be completely above it. Type 4, going way, way back. As, as you can see here, is it goes behind it. See that? So if you're looking down at it, it will actually look normal. So when you look at an AP view, it will still look evil, but it's or evil, evil, but it's an optical illusion because when you look at it, it's back like this. Type five is what I call the ski jump. That means everything has been torn and it is sticking out and probably trying to push out of their skin. No kidding. It, I call it a ski jump because it looks like a ski jump. And then the type 6 is whenever your clavicle comes down and gets hooked under your coracoid. I've been doing this 16 years and I've never seen one of those. Usually types 4, 5, and 6 are big injuries. Car wrecks. I fell out of a building. I got hit by a train. These aren't your normal everyday activities. But once again, 1, 2, and 3. 1 and 2, definitely not surgical. 3 if you're Sam Bradford is arguable. And then everybody else, all of us other mortals, we kind of get to do that. Okay? All right, any questions so far about AC joints? So, watch it one more now. Okay, here we go. A radiology x-ray view of the shoulder. A Zanka view is basically, so if you were to take an AP of my body, that would be straight on a Zanka view, or a Zanka, I don't know how you pronounce it, do you? Thank you. No, okay. But it's where you angle it 10 degrees up. Because a lot of times you can get stuff in the way, like their humeral head and all that, and it can kind of get in the way. So when you angle it 10 degrees up, it goes right up between your humeral head and that AC joint, and it gives you a very clear picture of it. Most of the time you can see it on an AP. Treatment, types 1, 2, and 3, once again, conservatively with the mobilization and physical therapy. 4 and 5, operative treatment with repair of the damage. So what we do a lot of times, or what they used to do is, they used to just drill a screw that went right across the acromion into the clavicle, just a straight shot across. Now it's more favorable to, uh, we have some stuff called fiber wire, and fiber wire is a t uh, Kevlon coated suture, but it's more of like a tape, so think of a scotch tape almost, but it's Kevlar, like the bulletproof vest. And so what we actually do here 
is, and I know this is small, or at least on this screen is, is so you drill a hole down through the top of the clavicle, go down through the coracoid, and then whenever you go through the bottom of it, you hit this switch and it has a little button that flips over sideways. So it's, it's kind of, once again, like this, and you're pulling against it. And then you, it has a second button on top of the clavicle, and you just cinch it down and then tie it off with a knot. It's pretty cool. And it works very, very well. Those are very, very uncommon. I can only think of, I think we've only done four of those, and I've been at this practice I'm in now for 10 years. So that's not as common. Once again, types one, two, and three are usually the most common. Um, other than that, so types one, two, and three, so the stuff you guys will see. Most of the time, that is something that's, once again, ice 20 minutes, three times a day, anti-inflammatories. Put them in a sling because your arm's pretty heavy, so if your arm's pulling down, it's going to be trying to separate that joint. Um, we don't let anybody return to sports until they can do a push-up. That's my test. So if they say, look, man, I've been going to physical therapy, I've got full range of motion, I've got full strength. In fact, this happened today, big football kid from Choctaw. And he felt great, looked great, examined great, but he couldn't do a push-up yet without hurting. So he gets to wait a little bit longer. And so a push-up test will rarely ever fail you. Because what happens is a lot of times people will say, okay, I feel good, I've got good range of motion, I've been doing some stuff, I feel strong. But like if you're a football lineman, what are you going to have to do? You're going to have to push somebody away from you. So if they can't do a push-up and push themselves away, they're not going to really be able to push anybody else away. All right, no yawns yet. Come on now. Um, proximal humerus fractures occur very commonly in the elderly and the majority. Uh, treated non-operatively, mostly, I, that should say. Injury comes usually from a fall or a trauma. Examination, they're going to have obvious swelling around their shoulder, tenderness to palpation, pain with any kind of range of motion. And you know, older folks, whenever they come and see you, normally they're a little bit skinnier and a little bit more frail, so that just blows up huge whenever they have those. Um, axillary nerve, once again, so loss of deltoid sensation, so you always ask them, hey, can you feel the side of your shoulder when I'm rubbing on it? Um, radiology, two views, x-ray of the humerus, or three views of the shoulder. Um, Nier's classification is basically what he says is, is it's all based on parts. So now this one, tell me the difference between this shoulder and this shoulder. Just off initial blush. Don't even raise your hand, just say it out. What's the difference in the shoulder without the R on it? And the other shoulder? It's broken. <laughs> okay. What else is different about it? His growth plate's open. It's a kid, right? So see, that's why you got to pay attention to stuff like that. So right there is an open growth plate. That's not a fracture. There's a fracture. So whenever you call and you go, hey, I've got this x-ray I'm looking at. Will you take a look at it for me? It would help if we knew that it was a kid because that may change that a little bit. So always look at for the open growth plate. You'll dictate that as a skeletally immature female or skeletally immature male. So going back to the near part here, so like this one, you can't see it, but it actually goes across and then up. So he would call that a three-part fracture. Here's one part, here's two part, here's three part. If it's just one fracture that goes across, it would be a two-part fracture. It's just how many many pieces you're dealing with. So that's what he's talking about there, okay? Uh, treatment, one part can be usually treated conservatively, two-part or more need ORIF, which stands for in Open Reduction Internal Fixation. That means we're going to open up their body and put something metal in it to help keep that fracture stable. Don't take, don't take that two parts or more to heart because it also depends on who you're dealing with. If this lady's 80 years old and the only time she gets up to go to the bathroom and take her teeth out, you're probably not going to take her to a major medical surgery, right? A lot of these things, no matter how bad it is, if, it, if they're old enough, first of all, their bone's going to be not good enough to start hammering on. Second of all, they're probably not active enough, and a lot of times if you'll just let them heal in, unless it is truly dislocated and broken, a lot of times, as long as somebody can raise their arm up to 90 degrees on most of our older folks, they don't care. Because if you can get it to 90 degrees, you can do your hair, you can take out your teeth, you can do whatever you want to, okay? Uh, so once again, I don't like rules like that just because you think, well, it's two parts, Travis said we had to fix this. That's not, a, that's not an absolute. Acute management, once again, if they come into your office or emergency room or minor care clinic, um, you will immobilize them. If you have an immobilizer, I always recommend that people get immobilizers. Does everyone know what an immobilizer looks like? It's very, very easy. It's a sling and it has a second strap that goes around your waist. Some of them are these big gray foam things that have little wrist cuffs. Those aren't comfortable. If you're buying them, don't buy them. Just get a sling with a strap on it. That's the best thing to do. No pillows. You don't need the pillows either. Um, complications are, of course, adhesive capsulitis. Adhesive capsulitis, we're going to come back to. 
So a mid-shaft fracture, same mechanics as above, um, which obviously would mean mid-shaft. Examination, radial nerve is most commonly injured. Uh, decreased wrist, finger, and thumb extension. So if they say, look, I've got this mid-shaft rate or humerus fracture, and it's kind of weird, but my, my wrist keeps hanging down or I'm having trouble extending my fingers. You guys have had all that right neurology already, so you know what the radial nerve, radial nerve does. So sensory loss at the dorsum of the hand, first dorsal web space. Uh, once again, radiology two views. A lot of times old people will not let you get more than one, and if you can even get one, it's a Christmas miracle. So kind of take what you can get. If you can get two, go ahead, but one may be all you get sometimes because they don't want to move it around because they're scared usually uh, for good reason. Um, treatment, initial treatment can be with a what they call a coaptation or a Sarmiento splint. Has anybody ever seen those splints that it kind of looks like half of a shoulder pad and comes down and then it has another splint on the inside with the Velcro? No, okay, good. Well, there, it's not a popular splint, but it, it, is, it is useful with this. So if you ever see somebody walking down the street and it looks like half of a shoulder pad hanging off and then it has another half under there, what it does, they call it a clamshell cast because it literally squishes it to keep everything in alignment. A lot of times people want to lift up their arm, but that's the wrong thing. You want to actually let their arm hang down, so we put their slings a little bit lower so the weight of their arm pulls down and keeps that mid-shaft fracture reduced and elongated because if not you try to push it up you're going to do this to it sometimes okay so it's called a sarmiento or a coaptation splint some other people call them like an elephant ear splint um, surgical treatment with an ORIF plate versus nail it just depends on the fracture patterns uh, sometimes they'll put it what we call an intramedullary nail make an incision on the side and drive a nail down just like you would their tibia or just a plate and screws like you would fix a distal radius fracture or something like that Complication, once again, radial nerve palsy and or a non-union. Does everybody know there are unions? Have you guys gone through that? Okay, so if I have two pieces of bone and they come together perfectly and they grow back together, that is a union. If I have two pieces of bone and they come back together and they grow together but they're displaced, that is called a malunion. And if I have two pieces of bone that stay in a good position or not in a good position and they never go back together, that is a non-union, okay? And so, uh, or an incomplete healing. Um, so those are kind of things to know too, especially if you have somebody that came in, like I had a lady that came in the other day that had a fifth metatarsal fracture two years ago, and she had a non-union, but when she hurt her foot again, the emergency room doctor said that she had a new fracture because it hurt, and there's a fracture there. I can see it on the x-ray. Well, he didn't know that we had already seen her two years earlier, and it just didn't heal. Um, and usually the only way you can find that out with is either A, hurting yourself again, or B, you can always get an MRI or a CAT scan. Here's a good example of a, a mid-shaft humerus fracture. And believe it or not, you could almost leave that one alone. The hard part is telling your patients that because, you know, they see, you know, if it's your wife or your husband and you're going, no, there's like this sharp thing coming off of it, and it's very, very hard to do that. But then when you start talking about the ways that we could put a nail down their arm, they kind of, they kind of see the light a little bit. Okay, clavicle fractures. Going back to this, though, because I don't want to go with this stuff too fast. Any questions about this stuff that we've covered so far? I know on the last one, stay with me. But is everybody good so far in everything we talked about? Okay. All right, so humor, or, um, shoulder clavicle fractures. Clavicle fractures typically in young children, not necessarily always. We actually see it kind of across, across the board. Most common is the middle third. 69% uh, of them are straight in the middle of your clavicle. Injury caused by a fall on a shoulder. So to tell you about my last clavicle fracture that I had come through the door, this guy came in, he was in it, I guess he was probably 25 or 30, but had his mom with him, so I knew something was wrong. Um, and so you could tell he was obviously embarrassed about it. And I said, well, okay, tell me what's wrong. And he said, well, I, I fell under my shoulder. His mom said, no, tell him the truth. And he said, okay, so we were with some of my friends, and has anybody ever human bowled before? <laughs> okay, so right, so human bowling. So, and I, don't, I think there's different versions of it, but his version was, some people were on a four-wheeler, some people were on a, um, like an inner tube, like you'd pull behind a boat, but it was on the land, and then there were a group of people standing over here. I stopped looking at the pictures when one of them had a Tyrannosaurus Rex costume on, and the other one had an American flag Speedo on. After that, I was like, you know what, I, I get the gist in my mind, I don't really need more pictures. But apparently they sling them around, and then you see how many people you can knock over. That is, That was their interpretation of human bowling. Uh, but and I don't know what the speedo had to do anything, but I guess it was just for flair. Um, but the point is, is you always have to get to the story because it can actually make a difference. And I mean, it won't make a difference in what you do, but it's kind of fun because then you can tell all your friends and family. Uh, 
Um, so once again, caused by a fall on the shoulder or a hit, it's almost like an AC separation, same type of an injury. It's just either this one's usually more of a blunt striking. Uh, pain and swelling over the bone. Remember, most fractures are going to have point, pinpoint tenderness to palpation. Whenever you have little kids come in and you say, hey, little Billy, what's wrong? And he'll say, it hurts right here. And I'll say, no point with one finger. And they'll say, okay, it hurts right here. But if you have somebody coming in and saying, it's right here, and you didn't see anything on the initial x-ray, you better go back and look again because little kids are very good at telling you exactly where it hurts, in my opinion. Uh, tinting of the skin represents significant displacement. Tinting of the skin obviously means if you have a sharp, jagged point and it's sticking up in the air like that, you can just see it looks like a little toothpicks trying to come out of their skin. Those are usually the ones that want to be fixed or need to be fixed because if it's tinting the skin, it can actually wear away at the underneath surface and end up coming on through. Uh, hematoma formation, you guys know what hematomas are. So here's one, kind of, and actually that one's not that bad. But, but that's, you can see that you don't have to have an x-ray or anything crazy like that. I mean, that guy broke his collarbone. But you can see how it's more in the middle versus an AC separation that would be way over here on the acromial clavicular joint. Uh, x-ray of the shoulder or clavicle, shoulder should, uh, should shoulder get access uh, for any other injury. I will tell you this, a lot of times whenever people break their collarbone or separate their shoulder, they usually don't have a lot of other stuff going on. I've rarely seen a dislocated shoulder and an AC separation or a torn rotator cuff and an AC separation. So usually if they come in with a clavicle fracture or an AC separation, you can go ahead and look because you know mom and dad have already checked it out on WebMD and they already know what they have and they already have a heel sacs lesion with a bony bank heart and a type 3 AC separation. So if you want to appease them, you can go ahead and get an MRI, but I tell our patients, look, it probably won't change the outcome, but if you will feel better about this, I'll be more than happy to order it for you. But very rarely do you have a fracture and something else unless you have a bad fracture dislocation on an elderly person, in my experience. Um, indications for emergent urgent ortho referral, once again, if it's tinting or coming out of the skin, or if it's an open fracture. Middle third can be tre treated conservatively. Once again, this is not a blank generalization because that's not always true and I'll show you why. Um, this will third need ortho valve and possible surgery because you almost treat it. Now, here's the thing. So, you know, back until, what, probably 10 to 15 years ago, whenever we would take people to surgery for this, we had straight plates. That was it. It was called a frag set, small frag set, small fracture set. There was a plate that you have these two little things that look like tuning forks and you could try to bend it because as you know, your clavicle twist, it also looks like an S from the top. So you laying something straight like a railroad tracks on top of your clavicle, unless you're pretty good at playing with Play-Doh, it's, it's kind of tough to do. And so until recently, like I said, roughly 10 to 15 years ago, somebody was smart enough to go, hey, why don't we make some fracture plates for the clavicle and we'll make a ton of money. And they did, and they did. So here's how we do this, because you know, when you get grandpa in there and say, well, I broke my collarbone, Nobody fixed it, and I turned out just fine as he has this lump sticking out of his shoulder. The way that we determine whether these need surgery or not is the amount of space between those two bones. If those two bones are touching, there is a good chance that that bone is going to be able to remodel. Now, they'll always have a bump there, but if they are in the relative vicinity of each other, your body has a good way of healing itself. It's pretty impressive, actually. That right there, if you feel like something could get stuck in between there, like a muscle, fascia, you name it, nerve, whatever, I don't care, but if, there, if there's something that lets you, that if something could slide in between there, obviously it's not going to let those two bones touch, those two bones aren't going to heal. So that's how we, in our practice, determine whether that needs surgery or not. Um, any questions on clavicle fracture so far? Yes? And that's not by any one beat or measurement? No. If you can imagine with your mind something sliding up in there, that's, that's kind of how we do it. Now, you can tell that person right there, you can say, because like, you know, sometimes you'll have people come in, and even though you have, and that was my hardest part out of getting PA, out of PA school is, you have this massive knowledge in your brain, and then as soon as you get out, you're like, I'm gonna change the world, here we go, let's go fight them all. Well, okay, that's great, Travis, but you know what, their insurance company doesn't cover that medicine, that, you know, you learned the one thing to treat it, and if that insurance company doesn't cover it, like, I remember the second line treatment, I barely remember the first line treatment. So that's the thing is, and that's the most frustrating thing of getting out of school is, is all this stuff that you think you know, you do know it, but then as soon as you get out, you're going to go, crap, I don't, I don't know what Cigna didn't cover that, you know what I mean, <laughs> stuff like that. 
So, so just, just get ready for it because it's going to happen. Just embrace it. Um, but yeah, so it, as far as that goes, you will have people that come in and either due to health issues like they have a bad heart or bad lungs, the age of the patient. Sometimes people are just so old, they don't care. There's like, I'm 80. I don't care if I have a lump there. And honestly, I probably won't be around that much longer. So I don't care if that ever heals or not. So you kind of, once again, you kind of have to know who you're talking to because even though on paper, when you guys circle A, B, C, or D, you know the right thing to do, sometimes all that goes out the window and it's kind of frustrating, honestly. So yes, if you can imagine, I, I would just say if I were going to give you a hard and fast rule, if those two bones are touching, they're probably going to heal with, because what will happen is, is that this will, it won't ever reduce, so to speak. But this will fill in, and then that will fill in, and then they'll just have a big knot right there. Okay. So, that's clavicle fractures for you. All right, rotator cuff tendonitis, uh, significant source of mobility amount, uh, amount of manual labors in athletes. Um, the way that I like to teach people about rotator cuffs, and if we have time at the end, I'm actually going to kind of view somebody and show you my shoulder exam, kind of the way it flows and all that stuff, because sometimes, once again, you go, oh, I did my empty can test, but I forgot my apprehension test and all that, so I can kind of show you um, almost like a little form of it, so that way you guys can start doing that if you haven't had fizz die already. Um, but one good thing to remember is usually people over 40 that come in with an injury, they usually don't dislocate their shoulders. People around 35 to 40, we start, I'm 41, unfortunately, but we start getting stiffer. You never hear grandma coming in and going, you know what's crazy? My shoulder is just so loose I can't stand it. What do old people gripe about? I'm stiff. I'm tight, right? So if you have somebody coming in, I kid you not, we could take 50 people off the street and you could tell me how they heard it and how old they are and we could all start guaranteeing almost what they did. If they're 40, 35, 40 and over with a fall or anything like that, have trouble sleeping, you can bet money it's almost their rotator cuff in some extent. Tendonitis, partial thickness tear, full thickness tear. If they are younger than that, remember, I'm not out throwing footballs and getting hit with my arm out like that. So for me to have a labral tear would be pretty rare, right? So that's where you, once again, you'll start seeing these things develop over time. And I don't want you just to go, you're 40, Travis said you had a rotator cuff tear, but you can at least start thinking of the process now. Uh, overhead activities uh, such as swimming, tennis, baseball, football, weightlifting, a lot of, once again, your manual laborers, the people who dig ditches, who lay brick, who lay tile, who do stuff like that. A lot of, remember, itis means inflammation. Inflammation is because of repetitive activity. So anything that you do repetitively, that can cause that, just like tennis elbow. Um, you guys already know all of your rotator cuff, right? Tennis, sits muscles. You guys learn those? Well, they're on there if you don't know them. The supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. I've been doing this 16 years, and I've never seen a teres minor tear, ever. So, I'm not saying it can't happen, but in all the places that I've worked, including Las Vegas, where there's a bunch of weird people out there, um, they never had that. Subscapularis is probably about 20 or 30% of the time, if not, that's too much. Probably 10% of the time, infraspinatus usually comes along with the supraspinatus tendon. Supraspinatus tendon by far, 90-95% of the time, because it's just the mechanism of the injury. Um, examination, shoulder pain with overhead motion. So a lot of times people will come in and they'll say, look man, if I'm down here like typing or mousing or doing whatever, washing the dishes, this kind of activity, I am okay. So a lot of carpenters and all those people say, look, my shoulder's fine until I have to lift for something. So usually any kind of, any time you get over 90 degrees and up, whether it's abduction, forward flexion, and, and most people don't do this in their everyday life, but if you were literally emptying out a can of Coke, that would bother them. A lot of times they'll also, and this isn't on there, but they'll also come in complaining of not being able to sleep on it. Man, I sleep on my right side every night, and all of a sudden, after I hurt my shoulder, I can't even lay on this thing anymore. I've been sleeping in the recliner the whole time. You can start thinking once again, oh, this sounds familiar. Maybe a rotator cuff injury. Special test, uh, near is impingement. So some of these were headed under the wrong ones. So the near test is for impingement. So let's go back to anatomy. Remember your acromion, how it looks like a bridge that kind of shoots up like that? Some people have different types of acromions, type 1 or type 0, type 1, and type 2. And the bigger the number, that acromion starts hooking down. So if you imagine me standing to the side, my acromion is sticking like this. So if I have a type 2 acromion or impingement syndrome, Whenever I raise my arm forward, my rotator cuff is going to impinge or pinch on it. That bone is there, and it's not letting me raise my shoulder up. That's what an impingement syndrome is. 
Uh, hawking is, and you have to be careful with this one because I kid you not, I've had five old ladies hit themselves in the face. But with it, you basically bring their arm up like this and you have them slap like a bird. Well, sometimes they get excited and they'll knock their glasses off and all that. So I learned to now, um, I will actually put my hand on their hand and push their arm away from them because kid you not, five people knock their own glasses off. Um, that is once again impingement. So if you can imagine, once again, you're a chromium. Now I'm bringing my arm up and I'm per they call it parading. I'm parading that rotator cuff tendon underneath that hook to chromium. And they'll go, yeah, I'm fine around here, but boy, as soon as I get about, oh, right there, and I can't do it anymore, and they'll always bend their knees like that. Um, empty can, once again, specific for the rotator cuff, tear or injury, and isolates the supraspinatus. You simply put their arm out like this, thumb down, and I'll tell them, I'll say, now look, you're going to push up towards the sky, and I'm going to push towards the ground. So there are three um, outcomes that you will have with this test. If I have their arm out like this, and I push up, or if they push up and I push down and it doesn't hurt and it's not weak, it's normal, right? I mean, it doesn't hurt. I'm not weak and it's not that. Now, let's say that I do this and all of a sudden, you know what? It is painful. And I'll usually do both sides at the same time so you can compare. And so uh, what I, is if, they'll, if I can feel that there's still the same strength on both sides, but they'll kind of go, oh, man, but yeah, that's it kind of right there. Well, then you're thinking tendonitis, partial thickness rotator cuff, because if it's full thickness, there's nothing to hang on to. You're just going to push it down. But if it's still attached or even a partial thickness tear, they'll have pain with still full strength. Uh, and then obviously, if you put it up like this, and I push down, and they push up, and they just, they can't hold their own arm up. It's a torn rotator cuff until proven otherwise. There is something called a drop arm test, and that's whenever I just literally put it up, and if I let go, it falls down. Now we call it the knee buckling test, because they once again always bend their knees with it for some reason. Um, a lift off and a belly press test, that's for your subscapularis. So does everybody remember what your subscapularis does? Okay, so your subscapularis lives on the front of your body, it's underneath, and it's what shuts the car door, or hits the tennis ball, or hits the golf ball, or something like that. So what a lift off test is, is if they have a torn subscap, which remember is how many percent of the time roughly? Around 10, 15 percent of the time, they can't do this. They can't lift it off because I'm internally rotating my arms, so they can't lift it off their back. A belly press test, some people call it the Napoleon's test because Napoleon always used to stand like this. And you say, okay, you push your hand on your stomach and I'm going to try as hard as I can to pull it off and you push down. If I easily lift it off, their subscapularis is not working. So that's called the lift off of the Napoleon's uh, for the subscapularis. But once again, not very rare, or not very common. So this is once again the nearest test. So you can see how he's standing behind her and all you do is just passively lift her arm up. So for him, whoever. And, and they'll get usually about right here, and they'll go, yeah, man, it feels like something's getting caught in there. And that's a nearest test for the impingement syndrome. Okay? Uh, Hawkins-Kennedy, so see easily, come up and punch yourself in the face. Right there. It happens. <laughs> uh, flex your arm to 90 degrees, stabilize the shoulder with one hand, and forcibly internally rotate like this. Now, they say you can do it with the thumb pointed down and all that stuff if you just do this. And once again, that's kind of a specific but not a very sensitive test, or maybe flip those around. Um, I usually don't do the Hawkins test that often. Uh, but once again, if they have any kind of impinge, uh, in pain, they'll, it'll be impingement. Uh, rotator cuff tendonitis and or tear. So the red part right there is kind of their pain-free zone. Once again, they'll say, man, if I'm down here doing this and stuff, it's fine. But whenever I start coming up, and it's actually pretty interesting, but whenever you have them do abduction, from about here to about here, just like that picture says, you'll kind of see them wincing. And after they get past that sticking point, they can do this all day long because they've already beat gravity. Their arms are already up in the air, so they can do this all day long. But once they start coming down, that's when you'll see them go, okay, hang on real fast, give me a second. It's the way down. Most people will tell you that their shoulder hurts more coming down when they have a rotator cuff here because that tendon is grabbing on as their arm is falling down. Okay. Uh, treatment, non-operative uh, for the tendon, this is the tendonitis portion. Non-operative, once again, basic orthopedic care, icing, anti-inflammatories, uh, formal physical therapy, steroid injections. This says no more than three or four per year. The place that I currently work, we will not give you more than three per lifetime into any one joint, into your knee, into your shoulder, into your hand. And in fact, the smaller the joint is, we won't even give you that many. If it's your shoulder, you get two. If it's a carpal tunnel, trigger finger, uh, the quarry veins, tennis synovitis, uh, tennis elbow, it's usually one, or maybe two if you convince us, but usually one. So three or four in a year, and, and the reason on that is steroid injections can be what we call catabolic. 
and catabolic obviously means that they can tear things down or weaken them. So we don't want to keep putting those in there because the question is, if you keep having to get steroid injections into your shoulder, why? Why, why haven't we figured out what's wrong and fixed it? Or just got on with it? Now, I will tell you there's exceptions to that rule. One being, once again, our elderly folks. If you're 85 years old, your rotator cuff will not heal even if we take you to surgery. So if we just need to keep you pain-free and happy, we'll give you steroid injections every three months for the rest of your life. But that's after you've determined that they're not a surgical candidate, okay? Um, once again, can cause tissue necrosis, physical therapy, occupational therapy. Once again, underutilized, don't just throw pain <coughs> medicine at it, which as you guys have seen on the news, everybody's cracking down on narcotics for a very good reason. Um, and uh, so, once again, that's not something that we do even that long, even after a, a major surgery. Uh, rotator cuff tear, same as previous, uh, except the tendon is separated from the muscle. It doesn't happen like that. That Whenever I read that sentence, I should have changed this, I'm sorry. It doesn't, in real life, the muscle doesn't pull away from the tendon. The tendon pulls away from the bone. Whenever we go back, and I don't know if we can see it or not. So see how your humeral head right here, the part that actually touches the glenoid is nice and round, and then you come up here and you see that flat spot there? That's called your anatomic footprint. And that's where your supraspinatus actually attaches. So whenever they say, and like I said, I should have changed it, but whenever it says that it pulls away from it, that's a separation of the myotendinous junction. And it doesn't happen like that. Once again, usually what happens is if this is my supraspinatus and this is my that footprint, it pulls back like that or it will split like that or sometimes even come up like that. Um, the rule of thumb is, and this is a little aside, but usually if a rotator cuff tendon is more than 50% torn, Okay, and some radiologists, when you order MRIs of them, they will describe it to you as a certain percentile tear. Some of it will call it a um, full thickness, obviously that's 100% torn, um, or high grade partial thickness, which is more than 50. Some of them will actually give you, and I don't know how they do it, but some of them will actually say like 47%, which I don't know how they do that. Um, but if it's 50% or more torn, the statistics are that somehow, some way, someday in the future, you have a higher chance of tearing that. That would be like me tearing a piece of paper 50% in half and sticking it out the window as we're driving. There's not a guarantee that it's going to tear, but there's a bigger guarantee than if it was not torn at all. Uh, now, if they come in and it shows a 30% tear, yes, it is torn, but we're still going to try our best uh, to, keep, uh, to keep you out of the operating room. Um, uh, another kind of fallacy about rotator cuff tendons is they actually don't scar in. So if you have a 30% tear today and you don't do anything to make it worse over the course of your life, when we re-MRI it 10 years from now, it's still going to be 30% or worse. So people say, well, I don't want to do surgery. It's, it's not that bad. Let's just let it scar in. Rotator cuff tendons will not scar themselves back in and will not rejuvenate themselves like most other things will. Um, that's why if you have it, like it's, it's there. Um, MRI the shoulder to confirm the diagnosis. Uh, that's pretty much the bread and butter of it. Four-year-old guy comes in, hey, I was coming, we actually had a guy that was coming out of his attic the other day, and his foot slipped off the stairs, and so he had to catch himself like this, kind of like a T, uh, and he tore both of his rotator cuffs at once. Uh, so that guy is pretty stereotypical. Hey, I have an injury, I'm a certain age, I can't do this, you need an MRI. Um, treatment, surgical repair is outpatient. Uh, they're immobilized for the first six weeks. I always tell our patients the first six weeks suck. It's you can't move your arm, you can't drive, you're on narcotics, you can't sleep very good. I don't know if you guys have ever tried to pull up your pants with one hand, but it's not as easy as it sounds. So your life is significantly altered for the first six weeks. After that, we get them going pretty quick and we give them their arms back. But that does kind of mess things up because even if they do have a sit-down job, they can't drive there. So not very many people have spouses unless they don't work that can take them to work. So people are usually pretty angry the first six weeks. Um, if the patient waits too long to have it repaired, there's a chance that the tendon can't be fixed. This has actually happened. So what happens is, is if you leave a tendon pulled off from the bone long enough, they'll start to get these fatty deposits in it. So let's say that you wait a year, a year and a half, and you come in and you say, okay, I wasn't ready before, now I'm ready. Well, when we put those sutures in there and try to start pulling that back down to the bone, it just pulls through. It's like sewing hair together. And then they get all mad that they wasted money on surgery and couldn't be fixed. Uh, four to six month rehab, but you're back to normal at one year. So the way that I teach our patients is, is at three months you're going to be about 50% good. 
At six months, you're going to be about 85-ish percent good, which is usually when we cut people loose. And then at one year is what I tell people. Whenever At one year is whenever I can call you saying, let's go arm wrestling, hunting, fishing, dancing, whatever. And you'll go, all right, let's go. That's at one year. Up until then, you'll go, eh, I just had shoulder surgery about nine months ago. And so people aren't usually very confident until around the one-year mark. Um, everybody okay so far? We need to stretch it out some, just push through, plow through. I'm doing good. It's not even 4 o'clock yet, right? Almost an hour early. Um, okay, so uh, this goes... We need to go labor tears. Okay, so a labrum injury. As I said before, your labrum is a 